Hey, good, ev good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Poison Pen Bookstore. Uh, my name is Patrick Milliken, and uh, thanks so much for coming out to our last official book signing of, of uh, 2019. Um, and uh, we're ending on a wonderful high note um, with my friend Matt Coyle. He's here uh, for his sixth book, amazing book, uh, in his Rick Cahill series. And then Carl Vondero is here with, this is your first published book, right? That's right. Called Murder Abelia. And um, let's give him a nice warm welcome to the Poison Pen. Uh, now I thought, just kind of, uh, you guys have been doing a couple of events uh, in California, different bookstores. Um, do you have your own little kind of act that you do, or would you like me to kind of model? Oh no, you go ahead. Go All right. ahead. I'll awesome. tell, I I told Carl that we didn't have to do anything for this one, so <laughs> we had our dog and pony show a couple times. So. Right. Let me. Uh, now we just have a dog. dog. Um, Murder Abelia. I love this thing right here. It says, uh, "Murder Murder Abelia combines private banking, serial murders, and Christian science." <laughs> that's quite. A, that's quite a set. Can you just tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah. Don't those uh, things go together for you? Of course they do. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's about a uh, banker for the very wealthy, a private banker who's been hiding a secret for 31 years, and that is that his father murdered 13 women in Illinois mm -hmm. and took black and white pictures that are famous of his victims. And uh, no one at his bank, he now lives in California, he's changed his name, no one knows who his father is, and then someone calls him on the phone and says, I know who you are. Killings begin and they look just the way his father would do them. And the only one that can solve them is the man in prison he hasn't seen for 31 years, his father. That's quite a setup. <laughs> yeah. So the Christian science, you could probably figure, wonder where that came in. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I, I was uh, raised a Christian scientist and I'd always wanted to put that religion in a book. And one of the tenets of Christian science is that you can not only heal physically people, but you can heal evil out of people. And I thought, well, what a perfect religion for the wife of a serial killer. So that's where it came in. Now, um, children, of, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your research into the book, because I mean, the, the, the idea of you know, the children of notorious serial killers, you know, uh, they must have very interesting kind of you know, tormented existences. Uh, what did you find when you were researching? I found that there are a number of children and they lead very tormented lives. Um, many of them don't know what usually their fathers did. For instance, uh, BTK has a, a daughter and um, she used to go camping with him, she'd play with him, bike with him, he walked her down the aisle uh, when she got married. And then one day an FBI agent knocks on her door and says, your father was BTK. She says, it was as if my whole life was a lie. And many of these poor kids feel that same way. And the natural inclination is then to deny that it was your father like this. So for instance, there's another guy in Russia, Mike, Mikhail Popkov. He killed over 60 people. Oh my God. And his daughter thinks he was framed. Mm -hmm. you know, he confessed. <laughs> so um, it's, it's very difficult. Charlie Manson had three sons. Um, one of them committed suicide. One, no one knows what his name is or where he lives. And the other one just came out recently. And he was only 18 months old when Charlie Manson was, uh, was captured. And it still affected his life. He was picked on in school. And now he thinks that, well, his father wasn't as bad as people think he was. So it's, it's very difficult um, because not only does your childhood seem like a, a lie, but all the things that you thought were not particularly significant, uh, like, uh, like duct tape, suddenly become very significant. And all the things you, should, you feel you should have seen. Plus, normally, or a lot of times, the towns regard these, the, these families as pariahs. And so they're condemned. And I think what's worse, and what's something I really explore in the book, is that um, you have to ask yourself, how could I love such a monster? And that contradiction is really tough. 
and you know your character is a you know is a private banker for the kind of the uber rich, and uh, and I understand you have some experience in that. I don't know about that particular segment, but um, I wanted to ask you about kind of your insights into that you know that real super elite world where big money and you must have did you have some inspiration? Did you come across some material that said, "Yeah, this would be good to uh, to write a book about"? Well, somewhat. Um, do you find in the world? Mine wasn't the uber rich in terms of you know like a hundred million oh, dollar accounts, and you know all that like stuff. That. Yeah, but they were wealthy. And what you find is that uh, wealth just amplifies all the family problems. <laughs> um, and I worked for one bank that actually had a psychologist on staff to help wealthy families. <laughs> so um, and you find they have a lot of secrets, and because you're the private banker. Um, you're privy to those secrets, and so there's a lot of discretion involved. Uh, there's a lot of protecting the kids from their wealth. Um, I remember talking to one guy who um, he wanted to teach his children the value of money, so he went and got $30,000 of cash, put it on the dining room table, he said, this goes to the country club, this goes to the private schools, this goes to the vacations. I mean, can you imagine? Thirty thousand dollars, and th that was per month. <laughs> His name was Baron Trump. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> a little more than that. Yeah, a lot more than that. Uh, well, I'll just kind of kind of bop back and forth between the two of you guys. And uh, uh, Matt, tell us a little. I mean, there's we were talking in the back about hey, this is a book where we can't give away a whole lot, but um, this book really kind of comes full circle uh, for Rick. And um, tell us what you can about it, and then we'll, we'll dig in a little bit. Everyone dies. Everyone dies. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, sixth book in the Rick Cahill series. It's really kind of a bookend to the first one, which it was Yesterday's Echo. And uh, Rick's whole um, literary life has been a quest for redemption. To uh, His wife was murdered before book one. But he was arrested for the murder up in Santa Barbara. He was a cop. Never tried, but never exonerated. He was at least never exonerated. So he feels responsible for her death, whether he may have done it or not. So that's the uh, that's been the driving force uh, in his each book in his life is his quest for redemption, this manic need to find the truth. And um, in this book, he goes back to Santa Barbara and he learns the truth. And it was a book I didn't really want to write. So I knew. It, I knew when I, when I was writing the first book, when I realized I was writing a series, that I'd have to address this issue at some point. But I didn't really want to at this point. Um, book four, which was is, uh, Blood Truth, uh, covered the, the uh, story of his father, who had also been a disgraced cop. And uh, it was an emotional book for me to write, because it was emotional for Rick, and also I just lost my father, who was kind of involved in my writing, or he was kind of a cheerleader for me. So it was, that was an emotional book. That was two years ago, and I wasn't really... A, ready to write anything with that kind of emotion. But I was under contract. I had to get a book done. And the only thing that was in my head was, well, you, as much as I didn't want to write it, was um, Rick going back to Santa Barbara. So, but when I started writing it, I realized that I had to write the book. It's a book I really wanted to write. And um, so that uh, turned out to be the perfect time. But it um, also, well, I'll get to it later. Go ahead. No. Well, I was. It, the, I realized when I'm writing this book is that I have to write this book for my continuing readers and not worry about new readers because the decisions Rick makes, the mistakes he makes, the darkness inside him, I think people that have been along for the ride would more or less understand it and maybe new readers wouldn't and it might turn them off to him and it's a first person book so if you're in the guy's head the whole time, you don't like him, you're not going to read very read much further. But I said, screw it, i got to write it that way. And um, surprisingly, with reviews I've gotten from even first-time reviewers or first-time readers, is they've, they've liked the book. So the, as I've said before, the lesson is just write the book you have to write and not worry about the rest. Right. Now, I was going to ask, um, you, you mentioned the emotional, kind of the emotional weight that the series has. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, at least a lot of my favorite you know, detectives in the past you know, have this heavy, you know, it, it's, it's usually a different story, but they, they carry some sort of emotional hurt, sure. you know, some sort of damage. Um, 
and it can be, you know, in, in lesser hands, it can become a bit of a, you know, a trope that people, people use. Um, but what, what do you think, what do you think it is? I love this notion that, uh, you know, the detective doesn't work the case, the case works the detective. Uh, I love that whole, that whole bit in, in uh, detective fiction. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Or, yeah. Sure. Well, I am short. My hands are kind of lesser, but uh, I think I'm getting a compliment. I appreciate that. Um, well, yeah, it is actually something I think about. Yeah. I think about because you're okay. The guy's got problems. He's got. He's sometimes he can't get out of his way, and it's in first person. So he, he's telling you how he feels the whole time. Maybe on the outside he's very taciturn, but inside you know what's going on. So his concern is there too much angst with this guy? Can I lighten it up? And I take. Opportunities to lighten up in relationships he has with uh, people, mostly uh, women, like his sort of sidekick, um, um, Moira, who's not in this book much. Um, but it is something I'm concerned about. I, but I think if for the work that you, you said it, and people said it before, the case working, the, the private eye or the detective, that's what I look for in each story. I want to find a reason for Rick to get emotionally involved in the story. And then it, maybe it can harken back to the issues he's got and this this need for redemption, but I, you know I try to make it anew in each story in that he does he gets emotionally involved with the case whoever the um, client may be. So yes, there is some of that dark cloud from his past, but he's because of that that puts him in this new case, and so it's every new case should feel uh, real and new, even though. He, the reason he's so manic about things is probably from his past, but that rolls over to make it a you know a new experience, hopefully. Right. And it seems like you know you. I read somewhere that you were inspired early on by the uh, reading the Raymond Chandler sort of manifesto, The Simple Art of Murder, yeah. which is a wonderful book if you haven't read it. Right. But uh, you know, there's this whole idea of of the detective having a, a, a code, you know, a code of conduct. And I was just thinking about it in terms of you know with Rick. That uh, you know he's gone through this you know this pain that really you know, informs everything he does in a way, um, but it gives him a lot of empathy, a lot of compassion for other people. And it, it, is that a motivating factor, you know, with uh, with the detective in general? Maybe that's a broad question, but um, I'm thinking about some of my favorite tortured soul detectives, and there are a lot of them out there. You know, the Rob Show and uh, Harry Houlin, and right. so many of them. Going through some some kind of suffering really gives them a, a better compassion for, and maybe kind of, you know, the whole this whole urge to correct society's right. wrongs. Yeah, I don't know. No, you're, I think you're right, and, and and when it relates to Rick, it's kind of this strange dichotomy where he's got to get to the truth of the matter, and he wants to um, solve the case, help the wrong person, but in doing so. He sometimes he takes advantage of people. Sometimes just some guy doing his job. Who, if he, you know, he's probably not supposed to tell um, anyone information, perhaps about I don't know a client or what have you. But Rick will somehow um, fool the guy or wheedle it out of him because it's the greater good. I'm going for the greater good. But he does feel badly about it. But he still continues to do it because there's this greater good. And he's actually, I think in this book actually. He, at one point, um, one point he's rationalizing these things he's doing, and then it could be another book. I'm not sure. It could be one I just turned in. But he's but he, internally he says to himself, you know, uh, isn't that what megalomaniacs do? Is a you know, I'm this is for the greater good. Right. So this is why I do this, and it's a, you know, if if you start to lose your sense of right and wrong, and you always think you're doing right, then it it can become a very um, dangerous way to live, not only for you but for other people. And he's he's walking that he's walking that line in this book for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's very light reading, very light. <laughs> <laughs> well, so is murderabilia. Yeah, that's yeah. very. Yeah. That's a yeah. tough word to say. Murderabilia. It's about art. I'll get it. Murderabilia. Um, like memorabilia. Right. Murderabilia. Memorabilia. Murder. Well, it ties into the question I wanted to ask you, which is, you know, these sort of gruesome relics from. That, that are involved in this case, the, the, the photographs, um, but also, you know, there are plenty of examples of that out there in the world. And uh, did you find that there's this, you know, really low strata out there somewhere 
where these things are, are out there and people can find them on the deep dark web and tell us a little bit about it. I did. Um, I I developed, you know, the... Happy the, holidays, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're too hard-boiled for that crap, right? Uh, I developed the pho photography in the book, and I, you know, the Harvey Gleidman took pictures of some of his victims, and then as I was doing that research, I discovered this thing called murderabilia, which there actually is memorabilia sold all over the internet. The, and these are items associated with killers. Um, so, for instance, Charlie Manson's hair formed into a swastika. I mean, these things are sold on the internet. Um, John Wayne Gacy did all these clown paintings. And, you know, some of these paintings, you have to, they're for sale for $100,000 or more. Um, it's it's kind of s sick stuff. Uh, the uh, it, Actually, there are dealers out there who will approach people in prison and say, you know, have you, know, have you ever thought about doing art? And you'll be really famous. It's America, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, you can buy, I saw Ted Bundy's glasses listed at $70,000. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer wrote poetry. Um, there's a, a guy named Charles Eng who did kind of still lifes of tulips, you know, um, and uh, the uh, Unabomber, the U.S. government actually sold his his items to benefit the vic I guess the victims. Um, Whitey Bulger, they sold his stuff too, like his jewelry, his sneakers. Huh. <laughs> you know. Well, it's funny, and you learn that you know rock stars are buying some of this stuff. I saw yeah. some program where you know heavy metal musicians uh, oh, yeah. are heavy metal. buying the stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, and the dealers say, well, we're just normal people. We, you know, we're not violent at all, and they're being, of course, uh, people are threatening to kill them and their families and doing all kinds of things to their families, and they're just, you know, buying and selling this stuff. And one guy said, you know, even our customers, they're just normal people. I mean. There was a woman in here the other day, she was a mother, and she bought a Gacy for her 12-year-old son's birthday. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, A vintage Gacy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and you think, well, I know that kid's gonna be paying a lot in, in uh, psychology <laughs> bills. Why don't I just get him a clown for his birthday? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In so a, in a van for a sixteen. <laughs> 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 so, so, so you know, in the book, the the father took these photographs, and they were all ex in black and white, and they were lit, well lit, and well composed, and they were done thirty one years ago. So uh, the idea was that he started the memorabilia market, and uh, they were all over the internet. And something you can't escape. It's funny, uh, Greg Isles, the author, was here. Last week, I guess, uh, weeks ago. Anyway, I was talking with him in the back room, and, and he was he was talking about Thomas Harris, you know, yeah. and using yeah. you know Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs as kind of a primer yeah. for uh, you know for crime fiction uh, thriller writers and you know of all stripes. And uh, that whole was his template really influential to you? I yeah, it was. To some extent, it was um, as if Hannibal Lecter had a Christian Science family. <laughs> you know? Maybe he did. Yeah, maybe he did. Good log line. Yeah. Um, obviously, Lecter doesn't have a family, but uh, Clarice is kind of like a daughter to him in many ways, and he's a father figure That's to right. her. Um, so it was a bit of a primer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's it's a fantastic book. Oh, both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, the whole notion of you know um, using the the uh, the monster really as a killer in in prison to help catch another, mm -hmm. you know, because only he would possess that kind of. Right. Is it's a fascinating idea. Yeah. 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 It was, and well, and what really interested me was um, the histories of the children. Right. And how they tried, they could never escape it. They could only reconcile themselves with it. Yeah, so, and the idea of, does he love me? Is he capable of love? Mm -hmm. Is a sociopath capable of love? It looks like love. Mm -hmm. 
you know? And so there's that doubt and that question. And um, the, the uh, son studying the father's pictures of, the pictures must explain why he was the way he was. And the pictures do explain and they don't explain. So. Complicated. Yeah. Complicated psychology. Yeah. Uh, Matt, tell us a little bit, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, your books are associated with uh, the city of San Diego, yes. for the most part, and uh, this one takes place in Santa Barbara, kind of going home, you know, in California, as this sort of mythic landscape for, for private eye fiction, you know, it's endlessly, it's endlessly fascinating, um, you know, I know you live there, but uh, do, you, do you find new inspiration in, in this concept of California all the time? Um, well, I think if I was living, no matter where I was living, I'd, I'd probably be writing the same thing, but, you know, maybe the topography would be different. Um, but yeah, it is, it is inspiring. Um, whenever I have to drive way the hell up to L.A., I try to get on Mulholland Drive, you know, just so I can, that's, that's kind of, um, sacred ground for, uh, PR writers, I'm not just sure PR writers, you, uh, Connolly writes about it and Chris writes about it. Um, but yeah, well, the reason I wanted to, uh, be in San Diego. I actually initially was going to fictionalize uh, La Jolla, which is where the first most of the books. There's always scenes in La Jolla, right. because I had to have a police department, and I didn't want it to be the San Diego Police Department. I wanted it to be small and insular, so I made up a, a police department, and La Jolla doesn't have one. And Chandler lived there. Chandler famously. lived there and died there, and left a bullet hole in the wall of one place where he lived, um, which was actually knocked down and resold for like four million dollars. Um, but my brother-in-law read an early draft of the book and said, and I called it as a nod to Chandler, I think I called it La Esmeralda or something like that, I don't remember. Um, but he said, you know, people want to read about real places, especially La Jolla's got some cachet, people from around the world know it because people will vacation there, maybe have a second home there, and so, you know, when you open a book, it, it says, none of this, the uh, novel, it says none of this is real. You know, it's fiction, so why can't I have a fictionalized police department in, in La Jolla? And it worked better for me, to, like I said, to have a small police department, so there is no civilian oversight, so there could be some, um, you know, some bad dudes getting away with some things, um, so Rick would have to go up against them. But there's a lot of uh, mystery writers in San Diego that don't really write about San Diego that often. Although Jeff Parker, T. Jefferson Parker, is up in Fallbrook, which is in the county, and He's now writing about San Diego on a PI with much, yeah, much to my dismay, <laughs> especially when I lost the Seamus Doom a couple of years ago. I, I emailed Ken, it. Ken Culkin too was very great. right. Ken Culkin, yeah, right? Yeah, really good writer. Uh, and uh, yeah, I know Ken's a good friend, but he's a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, but even Ken doesn't write that much about San Diego. Um, Not anymore. Yeah, and so I always wanted to be writing about the town I lived in. I thought, in terms of the genre. I, San Diego was underserved, and um, you know there's a lot of iconic spots in San Diego, and I try to have one in each book, but it has to make sense in the book. But in this book, I'm back. I'm in Santa Barbara. I went to school there a thousand years ago, but it's changed a lot, and uh, so I had to go up there and spend some weekends. Um, but the one thing that I really missed is that I like to live where I write because I can get in my car and drive around and get inspired and find new locations and things. And I couldn't do that when I'm writing about Santa Barbara. You know, I could Google Maps some stuff. Um, so that was, that was a challenge. That was more of a challenge than I expected. It was a little frustrating for me because often on Sundays I just get out and drive and then subplots and things come to me. So I don't think I answered your question, but that's the answer I'm going to use. Um, I forgot my question. Yeah, I just, I wanted to, I, my next book takes place in San Diego, so I, I want to continue to write about San Diego, but it made sense for me to write this one out of the town. But it was, it was a good challenge, too. Um, but... I'm not as specific with streets and things uh, uh, in this book um, as I am with in San Diego, but I'll even screw up things in San Diego. So there'll always be somebody who said you screwed something up. Do you? What do you envision for for Rick? Are you going to stick with him for a while, or are you going to uh, depart and try something else? Or is anybody here going to read the book? I can't say. <laughs> I can't say what happens after that. Sorry. I turned in a seventh book to my publisher uh, three weeks ago. That's all I can and say. All will be revealed. <laughs> I've read parts of it and it's really good. I can't wait to read. Yeah. Carl and I are in our writers group together. Oh really? Yeah. 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 I was gonna ask, how did you guys how did you guys meet? Was it the writing group? Actually we met uh, at a book signing. I did 
at Barnes and Noble. Right. Was it Mira Mesa? Yeah. 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 Like three years ago, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. 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 It was uh, Carl was in this group. Uh, right up. What is it? What was it called? Right. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not group. sure. Maybe you were there. I was there for a group, and I think maybe you oh, were just there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, sit yeah. right, read or something. Right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's disbanded, but... Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and, and uh, I had just gotten my agent. And That's right. My book. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it was cool, because, uh, you know, I'm... <laughs> I've written, I've got six books out now. It doesn't make me a veteran or anything, but, um, you know, we're all on the same path. And when you meet somebody, I know, like Carl and myself, very similar that it took us a while to get published. And to get the, and getting the agent is a big effing deal. Because it takes, it's hard to do. It's hard to get an agent. And then, you know, because I, I looked, I knew you did have an agent. I don't know if you had a book deal when we first no, met. I and then I, next yeah. time I see him, yeah, I, I, my book's yeah. coming out. I mean, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, t it took a, a, a long time to get an agent. I had one agent for a year, and then we parted ways, and then I got another agent, and then you get the book deal, and the book doesn't come out for another year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, then the, uh, the imprint, Midnight Inc., they decided to close their doors two months after I signed the deal. Yeah. But, um, you know, they've been good. I mean, they've supported the book, so we stuck with them. What do, what do you have going next? Are you working on a book, or do you have something? Are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. Nice. I'm working on another standalone book, and um, this the book we're talking about tonight is about a, uh, a son with a very difficult father. So I've turned the tables, and it's going to be a book about a father with a very difficult son, <laughs> who is not a serial killer, but a, a son he's had problems with his whole life, and uh, and the father has to get involved with a sketchy bank in order to save him. Okay, back. <laughs> have you have you had any uh, any Hollywood interest yet for murderabilia? No, not yet. If anybody's no. listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, there's the Prodigal Son that's on now, which is a, a similar premise, but um, yeah, it's it's not as good. Yeah, yeah, and spark the interest, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, what about you, Matt? I mean, it seems like it would be such a natural for some kind of cable TV. Absolutely. Anybody listen? <laughs> Absolutely natural. Um, Any bites? They're not just maybe like a passing nibble. Um, I uh, I just met my uh, my my agents, um, Hollywood agent at VoucherCon in Dallas, and uh, I kind of stepped out of bounds with them. Um, someone had shown some interest. I didn't really think they were doing anything for me, so. I talk to this person first, but I, the whole time I'm saying, you're going to have to eventually talk to my agent. But if someone's interested in me, I want to talk to them. So I talked to them, and uh, they got a little miffed. And so it brought about us meeting in, in Dallas at VoucherCon. It was great. It was because I, they told me all the things they were doing and uh, the close calls. And I think they realized that, well, they need to get me a little more involved, let me know what's going on. Because, um, you know, you're sitting out there in the dark. You don't know if there's anybody doing anything. So. There's been no um, no offers or anything, but I remember uh, it was a couple years ago. Uh, my ho the Hollywood agent C uh, emailed me and CC'd my agent, saying uh, my agent was in France at the time, and uh, so a producer had um, a network deal and was interested in the book. So can you send all the PDFs to him? You know, my agent was out of town, out of the country. And I go, yeah, of course I can. So I sent off the PDFs. And like two weeks later, I said, so when do I get casting? Uh, you know. Yes, yes, and no's. So I bothered her for months after that, but I knew nothing was going to happen. I mean, nothing ever did. But um, it was always so. There is the thing about today with streaming and everything. I mean, every, there's new streaming every week. There, there is a need for content, and you know I, that's the that's the hope you have. But I've learned to um, take everything with a grain of salt. Big rock salt, you know, <laughs> big grains. I was going to ask you. I, I was reading in a little Q and A that I think you have on your website. I thought it was which is great. You know, you talked about um, you know starting to write, you know, finally starting to write yeah. seriously. Right. And you said, you know, it took me 30 years to realize that if I wanted to be a writer, I actually had to start writing something, That's right. you know, I, what a concept. Right. And, uh, how did you, how did you finally come to that realization and start writing something? Uh, it is, you know, I have a degree in English from UC Santa Barbara, 
And uh, I thought I was going to write the great American novel, and that lasted about two months, and I had to get a job. <laughs> and I learned later that you actually have to work while you're writing anyway. But uh, it was, you know, when you don't, when you don't have to produce anything, you just tell people you're going to be a writer. It does have this lofty thing to it, and then they kind of catch on. So I was um, working. I'd helped put four golf companies out of business in ten years, and <clears throat> this was the fourth one that was about to go out. I saw the handwriting on the wall. I'd been there many times before, and I said, "Well, this is it." I was 43. I said, "I had a little, I had a little money saved up." Um, so when this thing go, goes down, I'm going to write a book or I have to find a career and be serious about working as opposed to thinking you're a writer. And um, sure enough, the, you know, a month later, I was out, of, out on the street and I didn't look for a job. I, every day I worked on my uh, kitchen table with my IBM ThinkPad, used IBM ThinkPad with the floppy disk drive. And, uh, Every day I wrote. It was really that I said this, you know, I put the line in the sand. And once I started doing it, once it, I did it, you know, for about two weeks, I realized, well, yeah, I was, born, I was put on the earth to do this. Whether I do it well or not, this is what I'm really supposed to do. It was really the best six months of my life up until, well, now. Um, and so uh, I wrote like six months. I wrote, I wrote what I thought was a book. It had chapter one, last page at the end on the bottom. So I was pretty sure it was a book. I thought, well, I didn't know much about the biz, but you know, I knew I had to get an agent. I'd get the agent, she'd sell it, I'd buy the house in La Jolla and never have a day job again. But thankfully, the guy I used to work for in the golf business, I swear to goodness, it was a week after I wrote that first draft, what I thought was a book. And he said, uh, hey, you know, I, I, this sports licensing company is working for, we got an opening in sales, you want to come over and interview? And I said, well, you know, I just finished the book and uh, I'll probably, you know, be a, uh, writing full time in no time, but yeah, I'll come over to your little company and help you out. And uh, I worked there for 16 years. Uh, I uh, quit uh, I quit my day job at the end of last year to write full time. Uh, not for financial reasons, um, for stupidity, but um, but uh, I'll tell you one other story about that. When I, he, so he, the whole time I'm working for this guy, he realizes this is what I want to do, and I he was a good boss, good guy, he's a friend of mine. So I, anything would happen, I said, hey, I got, I got, when I finally got an agent, I said, hey, I got an agent. I remember we were at a, a, um, a trade show in Vegas. <laughs> I said, I just got an agent. She just called me the other day, and I, I signed on with her. And he goes, well, are you giving me two-week notice? <laughs> said, that didn't really work that way. <laughs> I think I worked another six or seven years yeah. after that. But, um, but it was, it, that was the line in the sand. To answer your question, it took a long way to get there. I said, this is it, I can't, I'm 43, I've talked about this, I've bored people with it, you gotta do it or shut up. And, and um, having that little time, I think, was really important. And then, you know, and then I realized very soon thereafter that you have to write with a job, and this comes with a deal. But um, if I hadn't uh, lost that job, maybe I never would have done it. But um, the guilt I'd be feeling now would be insurmountable if I hadn't really done what I was supposed to do with my life. Carl, I guess kind of same question. How did you get going? Um, I've uh, been successfully unpublished for about 30 years. <laughs> and uh, I you know, wrote as my kids were growing up. I wrote everywhere, right? Uh, but I, d I didn't tell anyone about it because it wasn't the best career move when you're trying to be an international banker. And uh, so nobody knew but my family. And uh, I would do things like, you know, we lived in Montreal for a long time, and I would stop work, and in between stopping work and catching the bus, I'd go to a coffee house and write for a half an hour, 45 minutes, just like mad. You know, any chance I got, it was these little increments of time. Um, then we got here, and I got more into the private banking market, and I can remember the interview for my first bank here. Um, he said, well, what do you like to do for a hobby? And I said, well, one thing I like to do is I like to read. And the guy told the one that insisted on hiring me that, oh, you don't want him. He's a tree hugger. <laughs> He's, he likes to read. <laughs> He's really a tree killer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, a, a few weeks ago, I'm working in, in Starbucks, and I see this woman, not... It looks familiar, and she was the regional vice president for that bank. And I didn't recognize her because I hadn't seen her for 10 years, but we sort of recognized each other. And I said, yeah. Um, she said, oh my gosh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know, I wrote a book, huh? 
<laughs> and then I said, it's about the son of a serial killer in private banking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the expression was just worth all the years. <laughs> when you said I was working in Starbucks, I was like, well, that's an interesting lateral. <laughs> <laughs> you know? However, I guess they do offer insurance, man. I was thinking about the part time. You know, health care. <laughs> so just a quick, to Carl's point about not telling anyone is a great move because I told everyone. Uh, and when I was working at this, uh, I guess it's the company that we had a few changes, yeah, where I ended up uh, finally quitting last year. I was tight, well, we were all together in, a, in an office. I eventually worked the last 13 years at home, but um, I made the mistake of telling people, yeah, I, I, I read books, I wrote a book. And so they were really, can we read it? And uh, so I would print the things up, you know, at Kinko's or FedEx now, and I would give them to people, and so they'd read a second draft book or something, they wrote the very first book. And so now, when they might see in San Diego, if I got a book signing or something, they see in the paper, they think, I read that guy's book, he can't write. <laughs> so, don't ever let anybody see a first draft, although in, in, in writer's groups, that's all you see, basically. Yeah. That was, was yesterday's Echo, and that was your first published book, right? Right. And, but how many manuscripts were there before? That was that? it. That was it, okay. But it was probably the sixth revision. I was that guy who was writing his one book over and over. And I was going to, I finally had put it aside after, a, you, when you're looking for agents, you go, your A, your B, and a C, and you really don't want your C's. And I was a C agent, gave me a, a really good um, rejection explaining why. And I'd already started the next book. Um, but I sent it, I sent her email to this woman who runs our writer's group, Carolyn Wheat, who'd read, un, unfortunately, had to read um, almost every draft of every book I've written. Mm -hmm. So in the early drafts. Um, so I said, here's what you said, what do you think? Should I go back to this book again and, and be that guy who's writing the same book over and over again? And she said, well, um, send me $500 and the manuscript and I'll let you know. So I did and she gave me 12 page single space notes and two years later I ended up getting a book deal. But uh, here's a, one last quick side. I remember when I was looking for an agent and I had uh, um, a very nice agent, uh, Betsy Amster in LA. Um, it was one of those deals, sometimes you get a nice rapport with the agent, even when they're um, rejecting you, and sometimes they just ignore you. But I got a little email back and forth after she rejected me. It was one of those good ones where I like your writing, but this book's not right for me. She goes, you don't get discouraged, because it took Jonathan Kellerman seven books before he got published. And I'm thinking, I'm 50 years old, lady. <laughs> but uh, just trying to cheer me up. Um, how, do you, how do you find, that you, you know, obviously you're both in a writer's group, what are the pluses and minuses? I know we have some, some writers here in the, in the audience. Um, do you recommend writers groups? Um, are there positives and negatives to them? I do recommend them uh, because a lot of the time you, um, you think you've got a draft that's really good. And you find out you've missed the bar. <laughs> just in something really big. You've just totally missed it or it's unbelievable. So they're really good that way. Uh, for keeping you grounded into what works and what doesn't work. Um, at the same time, writer's group tends to focus on scenes. Yep. So it's really hard to get the structure of a book right. Um, there you have to go to an editor, editor who can see the whole thing and where the arcs are and where the different, uh, the, the different stages of the book are. Um, so those are the two things I think. Yeah, I, I definitely think they're beneficial. Um, and if you don't have a writer's group, you should have uh, beta readers, and they can't love you. They can like you, but they can't love you. Um, because, especially with mystery, is that you're not just telling a story, you're trying to lay clues, and you're not sure if you're giving too much information or not of information, or you may think you're sure, because you've got the story in your head. So you know what's supposed to happen, even if you're a blind pager like me, you, know, you have an idea, you know, you know what's, where it's supposed to end. So that, it really helps you with that, and I think that it helps to be in a group with that doesn't just write your genre. If they're good writers, and we're in a group with uh, three other good writers, and um, the one who's writing, I'm not, I don't know what you call it, Becca, what, what would you call the genre she writes? Um, kind of upscale rom-com. Okay, there you go. Yeah. She, she'll she pick, she'll catch stuff that none of the rest of us ever catch, and I'm thinking, oh yeah, that makes sense. So it's just different points of view really help, but yeah, I'm definitely in favor of it, and it, it, what Carl says about the uh, scenes is, is really, um, important but for me it's kind of a, it's kind of almost a godsend because I'll take especially with this last book I will take um, pages in and I think I, I want to apologize for what I brought to you people today because this is crap <clears throat> I feel that way every week 
And then, the, and then at the end, when I've uh, finished writing the book, the first draft, I will, I'll read it all the way through. And I thought, well, you know, it's not that bad. It's um, yeah. not good, but it's not that bad. And then I'll revise and blah, 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 and I'll get it up to where it needs to be. But it's never, it's always better than I think it is while I'm writing it. While I'm writing it, I think it's garbage. Yeah, um, I've had that experience too where I think something's not very good and they say, no, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it does work both ways. And uh, in terms of having other writers in the group, I was in another writer's group before that and they were more literary writers. And it helped me a lot more with the internal side of, of the writing. Um, so it was really good being in that group. It has to be... And I've been in groups long enough. I've been in Carolyn's group now for probably 10 years. But there, early on, there's a little bit of group politics. So you, after a while, it takes you to, uh, takes a while to grow that hard skin and realize and if you get lucky in a group like we're in now, where everybody, it's the work that counts. So you don't take um, critique personally. You definitely have, you're, gonna get, you're in a critique group. So you get critiqued every week. So you have to be able to absorb that. I, I generally think everybody's full of crap. Um, when they're critiquing me, and then the next day when I read, I think, well, they had that right. 95% of the time they're right. But even after all these years, I've been in groups for 17 years, uh, there are times when I think, well, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all part of the process. Well, and the other side of that is you think that everybody knows what they're talking about. And that's so, a good point. And then you really get mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> that is a good point, and that happens a lot, a lot of times to, um, I'm young in terms of a uh, number of years writing, I'll say young writers, where you know, they're listening to everybody, and you got to get the point where you trust yourself, but you're looking for oh, these tweaks here and there. Now, you mentioned, Matt, that you were a, uh, you were a blank pager, right. meaning uh, you don't do an outline. Right. Um, and you see, you, know, you see writers of all kinds, and they write these very, very detailed outlines, and then other people, you know, like yourself, that kind of go in. Um, for a lot of writers, that's terrible. Not having any idea. What do you start with? Do you start with an image? Do you start with a? I start with a generally with an inciting in incident. Um, I will say when I when I decided I was going to write mystery and I started to learn more about writing, I was amazed that the people I've talked to and this isn't this isn't official, but it really seems to me it's about fifty fifty the mysteries that a blank pager or seat of the pants we've always called it blank pagers or outliners and you would think you know you're writing mystery you're coming up with clues and most of them would be outliners but it really is 50 50 but i try to come up with an inciting incident and then you know it's always gonna be a dead body at some point i'm writing in first person so my guy has to solve the murder he doesn't see the dead body you see the murder you might see others he might be involved in others but um so there has to be an inciting incident and then there has to be a reason for uh rick to get emotionally involved and in the case and from there to me comes the plot i do have an ending i know that ending out there I'm pretty certain about, you know, it ch might change a little bit, but I'm just not, not sure how I'm going to get there. So um, every day I have to get on the path. And, and the further you go, the more the story fills out for you. But um, for me, the plot comes from, from the, the uh, character. What's going to make Rick's life more difficult? What's going to hit him hardest? Um, what's going to test, you know, his, that, that line he walks between right and wrong? So when I think about that, and then, you know, it's just some sort of miraculously, this thing, kind of, things kind of fill in. Um, so for me, it's always, the character comes first, the inciting incident, which will pull my guy in. That's where I start. And yes, it can be terrifying. <laughs> this way. And, and particularly this book I just turned in, uh, I've, I've done it six times before. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm really good at it, but I've done it six times before. But still, the doubt is like, I, I'll be in the middle of the book, and I think, you are a fraud. You've been fooling people. Somehow, those other ones worked, but you don't know anything. You don't even do you know how to still, write anymore. Do you still kind of write yourself into a corner sometimes All that you time. have to back yeah. out of? No, I don't. I generally don't back out of a corner. I definitely, I generally, generally when I'm stuck in that corner, something good's going to come out of it. And so um, maybe I, you know, find a way under the wall or something. But um, I mean, I'll, I'll do what I call drop anchors, or I'll put something in a chapter. I don't really know what it means. And then generally it'll help me, it'll help the book when I figure it out. But sometimes, yes, those I gotta pull up anchors. But when I'm stuck, the corners for me, and Carl, you're, you're not really an outliner either. I am though. Oh, you are an outliner? Yeah. I yeah. didn't think you were. Yeah, um, I do both. And the problem with an outline is it tends to be plot centered mm. rather than character centered. 
So you want to get away from the outline. I'm pulling myself more away from outline. I'm to the dark side, Carl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to play with you. Yeah. But I like to have the acts, you know, yeah. act one, act two, act three kind of figured out, and I like to know what the ending's going to be. But, you know, um, trying to deal with a sag in the middle is always a huge challenge. So. The middle sucks. I heard someone um, call it the, the beginning, the muddle, and the muddle. end. Yeah. 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 Was there a particular, and then I'll open up some questions here, but, you know, was there a particular book or, or even an author where you read them and you said, I want to do that? Mm. Yeah, um, uh, I always say this one. It's one of my favorite books. Um, well, a couple of favorite books, but um, um, uh, Winter's Bone by oh, Daniel great Woodrell. Book, yeah, great writer. It's a thriller, but it's a literary thriller, and it is so good. And it's also about the maturity of you know of a teenager, the coming to to um, to adulthood of a woman try, of a girl trying to save her family, and the the characters are incredibly drawn. The scenes of winter are amazing. You know the way he describes winter. I would highly recommend that book. And another book that I just read recently, um, which was written a long time ago, um, called Things They Carry by Tim O'Brien. And it's a series of interlocking short stories, but it's all about the objects that Vietnam uh, Army people carried with them. So as a writer, you really get to see how in the incredible power of objects. So. For me, um, it was probably um, The Long Goodbye of Raymond Chandler, which I was reading. I took a private eye detective uh, writing course at UC Santa Barbara my senior year. Um, if you believe that, and um, we read The Long Goodbye, and I'd read Chandler younger, you know, when I was probably 14 or something, but I, I was 21 at the time when I was reading this, and I just, just got a better, it just, you know, I'd read when I was young, I, I was a fan of Chandler when I was in my teens, but when I was younger, I was reading Agatha Christie and, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, because I really liked the, you know, the puzzle pieces, and black and white, and then I started reading Chandler, and it's great, there's some gray in there, and a drunk's not just a drunk, and it's Jack Carr. Um, and so that was that was one. And then l later, when I started writing and taking classes at UC uh, San Diego at night, um, Carolyn Wheat was my teacher. That's how I got hooked up with her. And she—I don't even think this is on the—I don't even think we were reading it. But she said, "Have you ever read T. Jefferson Parker?" And this is probably eighteen or nineteen years ago. So this was for him, probably maybe his sixth, fifth, or sixth book. I said, "No, I've never heard of him." And so she said, you should read Silent Joe. And uh, I read Silent Joe, and I think that was his first Edgar. Mm -hmm. And that just showed me how character is, I, I knew it, I felt it in my bones, but this was like, there it is on paper. Character is king, at least for me. And, and when I read that part, I realized, yeah, it all starts with the character. So I'd say those are the, those are the two books. But I think, I, you know, we absorb everything. I think I've absorbed everything that I've, I've ever read, the good stuff at least. Yeah, it, it's amazing, you know, I was thinking about what we respond to in books, and everybody's different, I'm sure. But you know, you open a you open a, a book that really <coughs> connects with you. And what is it that connects with you? Is it the connection with the character? Is it you know a really exciting? You know, you're drawn into a very exciting scene. Everybody's different. Right. Um, so let's open it up to some questions. I don't know how to ask this smartly, but well, yeah. you're super smart. You're the wrong panel. <laughs> <laughs> character development. That it's a good segue. What might be character development in a standalone book, when you've got a recurring character, at some point do you worry about, that's now going to get boring for the people who've read the first four because they know that? And how do you find that balance? And I've read a couple authors where all of a sudden it tips over into, okay, you're writing this for people who haven't read the first five. I know that. I'm bored. Oh, right. so that, that's, uh, there's, all, there's sort of two questions there. Is yeah. that, how much do you put in for new, if you're writing a series, how much do you put in for new writer, new readers to understand what's going on? And then the other thing is, are you just starting to bore people? And, and your book now, where I the character you. is darker in this <laughs> yeah. book, do you want to let the new reader know that there's a, a lighter guy back in the earlier book, so don't get discouraged, read those? Um, yeah, like I said, for this book, I didn't think about that, but um, it is really my most standalone book, A Lost Tomorrow's Is, because... It does, like I said earlier, the whole story about Rick's dead wife started before the first book ever did. 
but you know, readers have gotten a little bit about their relationship with each book, more the most probably yesterday's echo the first book. But this book, there's a little bit of uh, rehashing, not that much, but there's enough for new readers to realize the significance of what happened and what happened to Rick. There's also a few new things in the relationship for um, continuing readers to learn more about their relationship. I do worry, like I said earlier, about am, are people sick of this guy, you know? Because, as I, as I also said earlier, it's not just a, a, a um, series, it's a first-person series. We're in the guy's head the whole time. And is it just the same thing over and over again, or are there nuances? So that's something I worry about. And and kind of organically what happened um, to kind of lighten things up was in, um, really in book four, which is Blood Truth, where this character, Colleen McFarlane, which was um, sort of Rick's nemesis in the second book, and that he had taken over a case that she'd had before, and she got fired from, let go from it, and he didn't know, and then she didn't like him, but they sort of had to work together. I used her a little bit in a couple scenes in the next book, in the next book a little more, and then in Blood Truth, I was going to use, I was using her for one scene, the fourth book, one scene, and then that's what I needed her for, and then that was going to be the end, and then she asked this question of Rick during the scene, and I thought, well, I got there's something in there with her, and then uh, she was huge throughout the book, became um, kind of conscience of the book, I, I've said before, Rick has three sides, where Marga has four, and he goes with his gut, and she thinks things out more, so she kind of balances him out, she doesn't want to idiot sometimes, and, and he's, she's, he, his darkness, he's drawn her in to do things that she's had to do, um, but she, um, that put her in a real bad position, he's also done things that she, that he had to let her know about, that made her almost an accessory after the fact in some situations, um, but there, but after all that, there is some lightness between them. So kind of accidentally, he's lightened up with relationships with her. But um, it can't last. No, unfortunately, she's last. not. She's not really in this book much. So to start. Anyway, what about in standalones? How do you make the? How do you show the arc in a standalone? <laughs> well, there's only one arc. <laughs> And um, you don't, you know, when you write a standalone, you don't know whether it will go into a series, you'll follow the characters and other. And this one I decided, you know, I think this book's got to stand by itself. But there has to be an arc of the, the way the character feels in, in mind about secrets, about his family at the beginning of the book versus the way he feels at the end of the book. And how, um, you know, and, and in any good book, there's got to be kind of a, a reconcilement for the for the character. Although mine is really dark. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned about your writing groups. Yeah. And, uh, <coughs> you've been there with them for a while, and they're about now five or six, and they're mixed men and women. Yeah. Uh, do you? We just allow the women in last year. <laughs> do you find? Uh, Actually. Oh, Actually, we just allowed a man in this year. It's usually been me with uh, four or five women. Okay. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Do you find that sometimes when you're writing women or characters or a, uh, relationship characters and you, you, you submit your, 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 you give your submission and they come back and say, the women, right. you can't say that. Right. You don't understand women. Do you, well, do you get that? I am divorced. Um, <laughs> it's funny, in this group, there's both sides, where yeah. one will say, you can't do that, and then uh, the other one will go, well, of course you can, and you should say more. Um, so it's, it's um, there hasn't been a real problem for me in terms of writing women so far with the group especially, but um, yeah, it's something I'm concerned about because I have you know, been unsuccessful in every relationship I've ever been in, so I actually don't know anything about women. Well, and I tried to write something. Fortunately, I didn't know any better than to not do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the main character's sister is gay, who owns a restaurant, so I have to portray mm -hmm. a gay woman character. And um, mm -hmm. she's one of the strongest characters in the book, so you never know. Well, in, in that respect, just a follow-up real quick. Yeah. Do you, you have a, is there a generation gap, a, well, a difference in, in your group, meaning... <laughs> That, you know, you say like certain words right. that you think, I was caught just recently using the word thug, and I, 
I can't use that word. Right. And What's I that? Didn't know that. I didn't know that. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. well I'll, I'll talk to you later. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're the youngest we have, the youngest we have in our group, and this is probably the youngest I've had in a group in a long time, is uh, Becca, and she's 41, so she's the kid in the group. Um, I have a, my ex-wife's kind of younger than me, significantly younger than me, so I may ask her if I have, my guy's 40, 40 or 41 right now, but um, yeah, I'll have a younger character, so um, that is always a concern. Um, so I'll, I'll ask, um, I'll ask my ex-wife, and then, you know, if, if this makes sense, and uh, she'll usually tell me, no, you know what you're doing. <laughs> in, in the book I'm writing now, I have an 18-year-old right, boy, right. Mm -hmm. and there's nobody in the group that's even close to that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm looking up things on the internet, but I'm, I'm still going to have to get with somebody that's of that age mm -hmm. to get the right, the right voice. That, that is, that's a good question, because that is, that is something that's difficult. But really, these people over here are the youngest people that read, would read our work, because really, the people that read our work are, are my age and above, to be honest. But, um, but still, you know, they don't want to read about thugs, I guess. <laughs> sure they do. I don't, yeah, I don't know. What do you, what's the proper word now for thug? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm still working. I, yeah. I, 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 I drop a line. I don't call anybody thugs anymore. Don't they? No, there's. Uh, I mean, I'm going to have to take that as a look. <laughs> there's a racial con connotation now. Oh, for thugs? Uh, really? 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 That's what I'm told. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Back when I was young, thugs were all colors. <laughs> and yet you can use bitch now. <coughs> That's right. In everything. And for, yeah. for all, yeah. gender, all genders. Yeah. That's a great word. Yeah. <laughs> then again, you know, it's like in, in, in our in our genre here in crime fiction, you know, who wants to read about healthy, well adjusted people <laughs> that makes that make good decisions, you know? I think you're it is genre really have, though, yeah, you know. yeah, you're not gonna have a novel with that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You want uh, conflict or yeah. there's a book I can't remember how. You guys know this book, Immediate Fiction by no. Jerry Cleaver. It's a great book. He says, um, rest assured, if your characters are having a good time, your readers are not. So good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great. Yeah. I you definitely know. adhere to that. Uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, I got a question along that line. Writing a very dark story, is it depressing? I mean, it, you know, day in, day out, writing this, how do you find it affects you, or does it? Right, what you know? No, I, I no, I don't find I don't find it depressing at all. Um, sometimes I get I get uh, well, maybe a little bit. I might get a little emotionally caught up with my character sometimes and think that his life does kind of suck. Um, but then I look at mine. I think this isn't that bad. So no, actually no, I don't. Do you? Uh, well, you do well, something different though. Yeah. Well, I I don't find it depressing till I tell my wife about it. <laughs> and then you're doing what? <laughs> he does what? Yeah, and now it's published. And now it's published. And and yeah, and I thanked you for it and the acknowledgments. You did what? <laughs> um, and but yeah, you you there is a way you kind of get. I mean, I had to do a lot of research on serial killers and what they did to their victims, and you know you kind of get numb to it. Um, and I actually had to pull back some things that were too much. Um, and fortunately, you know, people advised me to do it. So um, it, it can be depressing. Um, well, for sure, if you do that kind of research. Yeah. Yeah, but I, yeah. I think pulling back was a good idea because your book's, it's a character-driven book. Yeah. You don't want to gore people out. No. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> Anybody well, else? Yeah. And even even my serial killer father, um, I it's not so much the killings I found that were you know interesting to write, but the interactions he has with his son and how a sociopath you know um, toys with his son that was kind of interesting to write. Yeah. Puts on the mask. His ideals for child rearing. <laughs> yeah, right. Because your kids are adults. It's amazing how these you know, these characters will put on the mask of being a, a real human being, you right. know, and mimic that. But uh, anyway, we love this. Um, I'd like to thank you guys very much for coming out, and uh, our pleasure. Thank you for this. Thank you everybody for coming out. Yeah. Sure. Thanks everybody online, and happy holidays to everybody. Have a safe.
safe and happy 